Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. This week, our dinosaur of the day is Minmi. Good choice. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, this is a good one. All nice and ankylosaur-y. <laughs> we also have a bunch of dinosaur news. And as always, we would like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons. This week, we would like to thank Scotty, Jackson, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jules, Grandpa Dino, and Rhinosaurus. And Rhinosaurus is new, so thanks. Thanks to all our Stegosaurus patrons. If you want to join this group of amazing people or any of our other tiers, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping right into the news, we have a new dinosaur. A pretty one. Yeah, it is a cool one. And it's been in the news a little bit already, but I think it came out the day after we recorded our last episode or something like that, which pushed it back a cycle. It was published in Nature Communications by Dong Yu Hu and others. And really what it's all about is that these paleontologists think that they might have established a new way to see colors other than orange and black in dinosaur fossils. Mm. So we talked a little bit before about how you can probably tell both orange and black by looking at the shape of melanosomes. And as a quick refresher, melanosomes are these small cells that are in a lot of animals, especially dinosaurs and reptiles and things, and they produce both the black and red coloration that you see, including the red hair that is on my head. It's similar. <laughs> I like <laughs> similar to bring cells. that one up. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure if eumelanin, the one that makes the black color, I don't think that's what makes black hair. I think that might be something else that makes that. I'm not really sure. Yeah, you don't have that hair color. Why yeah, would you know that? That's not important to me. <laughs> <laughs> it actually probably is, because mammals basically only have those two colors. Anyway, long story short, there are these melanosomes and they fossilize. And so if you can see the shape of them, if they're these long rod-like ones, then they're eumelanosomes and those ones are the black color. But if they're round, they're a pheomelanosome and that produces the reddish brown color. So you can look at these fossils and potentially tell what color they are. And for a while too, there was a competing hypothesis that maybe this was actually fossilized bacteria or some other sort of decay process or something that was producing these shapes when you look at it under a microscope. But more and more evidence is being put forward to show that it's probably actually a melanosome, including in this paper, again, they went back and they looked for certain features of bacteria that hadn't been checked before and they didn't see it. So again, they're reasserting that it's probably a real melanosome. We also talked about at SVP last year, Babarovic, <laughs> the guy who said that he spent months in a basement or maybe weeks in a basement with dead birds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that kind of stands out in my memory. He was looking for non iridescent structural colors, which involve melanosomes. And he presented on a blue and black bird he thinks is what it ended up being. And I say bird because it's after all the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. I think his was from about 40 million years ago, if I remember correctly. Obviously, since this is a dinosaur podcast, the one we're going to talk about is a little bit older. It was found by a different group in China, and it's from the Jurassic. It's a small theropod, bird-like, about a pound, like a lot of things that are found in China. And it was found near Beijing, also like a lot of dinosaur fossils from China. And they named it Saihong Juji, and Saihong is Mandarin for rainbow, and Juji is Mandarin for big crest. Big crest rainbow. Yep. <laughs> or rainbow with a big crest. Isn't that all rainbows? Well. Crest shape ish Yes, that is true. I don't know if it'd be a crest. It's more like an arch. Oh, I guess. Because I think crests are kind of solid. 
But in any event. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Yeah, it was a good effort. It doesn't have anything to do with the rainbow. Those are two separate things. Because this dinosaur, weirdly, both had large feathers that potentially had rainbow coloration on them. But it also had a bony display structure, thus the crest. So it was kind of like super flamboyant. It's got all these different display things going on. And they describe it saying that its tail was larger than Archaeopteryx and its arm and leg feathers were longer than Anchiornis. Hmm. So that's a lot of big feathers going on on this dinosaur. Yeah, it'll get attention. <laughs> exactly, which I think is what it's going for. But weirdly, they say the tail had asymmetric feathers, but the arms didn't. And that might be why they called them arms and not wings, because <laughs> <laughs> it probably couldn't have flown with these big feathers on its tail and without the asymmetric flight-like feathers on its arms slash wings. So on to the part that made it really interesting and exciting and gave it its name, which is the rainbow part. It has feathers that were really well preserved. So they actually bought it from, I think, the guy who found it while farming or something. And they were really excited because it looked so well preserved. When they put it under an SEM, they looked at all these melanosomes that look like they're preserved and the structure and shape of them. So basically the first thing was the length and width of the structures and these nanoscale structures overlap with several different modern bird colors. And really it's super hard to see, but they believe that there were probably red, orange, green, and blue feathers on its neck. Wow. At least that's how they depict it in the recreations. They're a little bit more conservative in the actual paper than they were in the <laughs> in the drawing of it. Obviously, you have to pick colors when you're drawing something. You can't be as ambiguous about where the coloration is. But they describe several what they call platelet-shaped nanostructures. And what that is, we talked about it a little bit with that SVP presentation, but... If you arrange these melanosomes in certain shapes, you can actually create colors because since it's on a nanoscale and colors are on the nanometer wavelength, you can affect the way light kind of reflects off of the structure and you, you can make structural colors rather than just making pigment-based colors. So it's not reflecting off of a color and usually what happens is the pigment kind of absorbs some of the color and the part it reflects back is what you see. In this case, it's reflecting off the structure. So it's a totally different kind of thing than we're used to seeing when it comes to color. But it's what birds use a lot of the time. So what they did was they compared these different sort of structures in the different patterns and things to modern living birds. And they found that it looked like maybe you could get the range between red and blue just from what they found in different parts of the feathers. The coolest thing about it is that all of these structures basically just use those eumelanosomes, the rod-shaped ones that generally produce a black pigment. That just seems crazy because <laughs> how can this thing, which would normally be seen as black, make all these different colors? But like I said, it's, it's the structure of it itself that seems to make the colors. And they couldn't tell the exact colors, but they did say in the paper that they think it had several different colors, just based on the wide variety of different shapes and structures going on in the feathers. And I'm shying away from describing the actual structure because these SEM images that they have of it look so different than the modern birds because obviously it's been fossilized that it's really hard to kind of describe exactly how they are. The best way to describe it is probably kind of like overlapping scales. It sort of has that look to it. Hmm. And then they kind of are in different angles. So sometimes they overlap more or less. Sometimes they are a little bit more at an angle. So it's it just slight variations on overlapping platelets, <laughs> basically. They did recognize that pigments, meaning mostly carotenoids, may have affected the color, but they think the structure would have made a bigger difference on the color. So if it did have carotenoids in the feathers, it probably would have just been a slight adjustment to the color that you get from 
the structural color rather than kind of overriding it. So if we can figure out exactly what color these different structures would make, it would probably give a pretty close approximation to the actual color. So when they finally made the recreation of Sai Hong, they ended up with a dinosaur that's mostly iridescent black on the wings, the back, and the tail. But then on its neck, they showed all this rainbow coloration. So part of it's blue, part of it's green, part of it's red, and part of it's orange. But I think that's mostly because this is the main part where the feathers were preserved so well. I'm not sure that they definitively think that these structural colors weren't present in other parts of the bird. I think it's just kind of like a default to black where you don't have evidence that it was a different color. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I don't think it's really going to satisfy everyone because a lot of people still haven't even accepted that these are definitely melanosomes and still think they might be bacteria or something else. Hmm. So now taking it a step farther to saying, oh, and we think we can tell it's green because they overlap a certain way. <laughs> it's really, I don't think a lot of people are going to be on board with that yet. Give it some time. Yeah. But I mean, it, I don't necessarily think it's... Oh, it's not necessarily correct either. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll give it time to see whether or not it is correct as well as <laughs> what the consensus ends up being. That'd be cool if it was. Yeah, for sure. We've talked a lot before about how we could tell if dinosaurs were either black or orangish brown, but that's about it. So it would be awesome if we could start to see what color things are. And then you might be able to see something like with Uteranus or something, what color these large predators were. Pink. <laughs> I don't know if they have a pink. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? It would be. <laughs> but I don't think they know of structural colors that are pink. I think it's just red, green, and blue okay. that they know of for structural. At least that's all they talked about in this paper. Well, even if it was any of those colors. Although I guess it's been depicted as red before. Mm -hmm. I don't. You don't usually see dinosaurs depicted as blue or green, though. No. I mean green when they're scaly and lizardy. Yeah. But not with the feathers. With feathers. Makes me think of a peacock. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking that this dinosaur is kind of like the peacock before the end Cretaceous mass extinction. <laughs> but it was like pretty early. I mean, it's in the Jurassic, so it's early days for dinosaur feathers. Eh, good for it. Yeah. Next up, we've got an article that's all about dinosaur air sacs. And it was written by Marcus Lamberts and others and published in Biology Letters. And if you're familiar with, what hollow bones are, at least in dinosaurs. It's this really cool bone structure. It's not actually hollow. It's more like the air sacs, which are connected to the lungs, are sort of pressing into the bones and making space for themselves. <laughs> at least that's how I imagine it. I know it's not really that simple. But the process is called pneumatization, basically for like airifying, <laughs> I guess <laughs> would be sort of the translation of that. And we've seen with some dinosaurs, like sauropods, it seems to happen as they age. The air sacs kind of invade the bones, they refer to it as, and it makes their breathing a lot more effective because they effectively are always breathing in because they refresh these air sacs in a fancy way so that the air sacs refill their lungs when they breathe out. So they're always getting fresh air into their bloodstream. It's just awesome. I really wish that I had air sacs. <laughs> I think it's really a dinosaur's number one adaptation because it's likely one of the reasons that they're such competent flyers. They can really get their metabolism going with that. And the reason they could get so big because they can lighten their overall skeleton using these air sacs. It's a pretty awesome adaptation. Feathers are also cool, but I think air sacs are a little more impressive. <laughs> <laughs> So these researchers were looking at specific bones, and they wanted to see how the bones were affected by the parts that were contacted by the air sac. So they made these really up-close microscope images, and they sliced the bones and did all sorts of things to really get in there. And they found that there's a new type of bone that no one had noticed before at this interface, and they call it pneumosteum which is, I guess, like air bone. And pneumosteum is present in both modern dinosaurs, aka birds, and non-avian dinosaur bones. 
So they did all sorts of different comparisons with lots of modern mammals and birds, as well as extinct animals. Like they actually cut into an extinct cattle species to make sure that it didn't have this new mastium because you wouldn't expect it, mm-hmm. as well as a moa, which did have it in some places. And they compared different parts of the bone. So for instance, on a vertebra of a sauropod, the bottom part where they expected to see this new mastium because they think that there was an air sac there, did have it, but the top part didn't. And that was actually the first application of this theory. It helped to show that sauropods probably had air sacs in the neck because it had this new mastium there. Pretty awesome. And if you're wondering what differentiates new mastium bone from other bone, at first, looking at it as a layman, because I'm not a osteologist, I guess, (laughs) or even paleontologist for that matter, the holes look really similar to the muscle attachment points that you see in bones. They're like these tenth of a millimeter holes, and you can see them. Obviously, when you have a tendon attaching to a bone, it has to interface somewhere, so you'd expect to see some roughness to the bone, and you do, and superficially, pneumosteum looks a lot like that. But when you look really closely at it, you can actually see that the fibers in the bone look different. Typical bone is lamellar, which is kind of these parallel fibers. It grows like a tree or something, you know, extending outward, so it's building on itself. But this new mastium has these densely packed fine fibers, which aren't nearly as pretty. (laughs) They're a little bit less organized looking under the microscope, and... They're, like I said, more densely packed. So when you compare different parts of the bone, you can see if it's pneumosteum or not. Oh. This obviously has a lot of really cool potential applications. For one, like they already did, you can test to see if there is an air sac in part of a dinosaur where you don't have other pieces of evidence to suggest it. You can also find evidence for air sacs with really fragmentary remains because just a little piece of this pneumosteum is an indicator of an air sac regardless of how big the piece of bone is and i think the coolest thing is that it can help tell us about the evolution of air sacs which we don't really know that much about there's a big question about when they began if it dates all the way back to archosaurs and it's a shared trait with something like pterosaurs or not they didn't actually look at any pterosaurs in this study but i'm sure that people will start looking soon and it also in my opinion, could help with the whole ornithoscolida debate. (laughs) Because if you see the air sacs evolve in one branch of the dinosaur group, but not the other, you might be able to sort of see this shared trait, which gives you another element to base your dinosaur phylogeny on. Interesting. They did point out, though, that there were a few birds that had air sacs that didn't show this kind of bone. And they think it's because the birds were so small that they didn't need this type of air sac bone or something. So it's not quite perfect yet, but it does seem like they found a new type of bone, which is obviously really cool. And one more piece of science heavy news. (laughs) It's a taphonomy study written by Paul Ullman and others and published in Geobios. And if you don't remember, taphonomy is the study of how animals decay and then become fossilized. It's kind of funny. We've (laughs) paleontologists talk about taphonomy all the time. And it's pretty funny because it usually comes about if you see something like roadkill, because it's like, ooh, taphonomy experiment. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Basically, the way taphonomy experiments go a lot of the time is you just have a dead thing out in the wild and then you just watch it to see what happens. (laughs) See if it gets scattered. Yeah. Because taphonomy includes how the bones get scattered by scavengers, as well as how they get buried, and then how they get preserved, and everything in between when the animal dies and when it's a fossil. So there's a lot of different types of experiments you can do, which isn't true for most fields of paleontology. The researchers went to the Standing Rock Hadrosaur site, also known as SRHS, which was the abbreviation of one of my high schools. I read that and I was like, that looks familiar. And then I was like, oh yeah, that's why. (laughs) But since it's a hadrosaur site, you could probably guess. It's not a high school. Yeah. (laughs) And that it's a hadrosaur that they're looking at the taphotomy of. 
Specifically, they were looking at an Edmontosaurus bone bed in South Dakota, and it's from the Maastrichtian Hell Creek, also known as the latest Cretaceous. Latest and greatest Cretaceous? Most people think so. It's got T-Rex and Triceratops and all that good stuff. <laughs> and Edmontosaurus, which is no slouch. <laughs> no slouch. <laughs> it isn't. It's huge. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but it had good posture, too. Uh, it kind of had a humpback, actually, so oh. maybe it was a slouch. <laughs> but... <laughs> No figurative slouch. <laughs> they found almost every bone that you'd expect to find from an Edmontosaurus, meaning like almost a fully articulated skeleton. And there were at least two individuals at the bone bed, but this one hadn't been reviewed for its taphonomy greatness yet. So these researchers decided to do it. And they found that most of the bones were horizontal and not worn down that much, or what taphonomy people say as unweathered bones. And that means that it was probably buried quickly, and it wasn't transported very far by either water or animals. And that's what you kind of want, right? Yeah, it's definitely more helpful in a paleontological context if you're trying to study an Admontosaurus, because you've got all the bones they're relatively close to where they were when the animal died and all that good stuff. If things look like they've moved too far, then you have to discount a lot of the information about them. I think there's been debates, too. It depends who you talk to. Some paleontologists, I think, place more emphasis on how scattered it is and others less so. Yeah, at SVP, there was a talk about how even if things get transported really far, they probably end up in the same sediment layer. Mm -hmm. So... But other people want to discount that kind of thing, because if you saw it moved really far, then you worry about it. <laughs> they also say that there was a fair amount of pre-burial breakage, which means that some bones were broken, you know, while it had either just barely died or before it died. And some of the bones were also turned parallel to one another, which means that they moved quite a bit. And that could also indicate that they were just getting moved by like a river or something like that. Another piece of evidence is that other plants and animals in the formation look coastal, so that's kind of a clue. These taphonomy studies, more than anything, are almost like a forensic scientist job where they try to piece together a bunch of different types of evidence to guess how the animal died and then got buried. So they're always interesting studies. But when they put together all these pieces of evidence, they decided, quote, Cumulatively, these data indicate that a herd of primarily subadult and adult Edmontosaurus died in a nearby fluvial setting in a mass mortality event, and following brief decay and scavenging by theropods, their bones were buried in a shallow floodplain pond by a flooding event or a crevasse splay. Our findings provide supporting evidence for the hypotheses of gregarious herding behavior in hadrosaurids and age structuring of Edmontosaurus herds, end quote. Some pretty cool conclusions to make from just some bones that were buried in a certain orientation with some breaks. <laughs> and obviously, that's really cool that they think they have more evidence to Edmontosaurus living in herds. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with what a crevasse splay is, I had to look it up again to be reminded. It's when you have a river and rivers naturally form these banks when they meander around by carrying silt and then piling it up in different spots. But occasionally the river will break through its bank and if the bank is higher than the surrounding area, it'll flood down and make kind of like a little miniature brief flood into the surrounding area. So that's a crevasse splay, and obviously, if the river is very large, and this is a big break, it could flood and kill a lot of animals in the area. It happens to people sometimes. So obviously, you know, when a levee breaks, they refer to this sometimes as a natural levee breaking, which gives pretty obvious comparisons to certain floods that have happened mm -hmm. around the world. And obviously a good way to bury an animal quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> makes sense. So speaking of natural disasters, you might remember that there were two big earthquakes last September and they actually damaged about 5,000 schools around Mexico City. And so to help raise funds to reconstruct those 5,000 schools, there was a dinosaur tail that was found in Morocco and it was auctioned off. And it was a, a sauropod tail specifically from 
Atlasaurus. It was about 13 feet or 4 meters long, and the tail sold for 1.8 million pesos, which works out to be about 96,000 U.S. dollars. But hmm. authorities in Morocco said that they didn't think the tail was authentic and was instead assembled from a number of isolated vertebrae. Oh. And that they had not issued an export permit for the vertebrae. Uh-oh. So it remains to be seen what's going to happen next. So it's both fake and stolen, <laughs> potentially. Yeah. That's not well, great. <laughs> is it fake if it's just assembled from a number of vertebrae or is I mean, if you it's mount it, vertebrae. I saw the picture of it, and they mounted it like it was an articulated tail. Yeah. So that's basically fake. That's similar to what sometimes happens in Asia, where they glue together different fossils to mm. make it look like it's one more complete fossil. But sometimes fossil. you have composites even in museums. For sure, if they're different individuals, but from the same species. Oh, I see. Yeah. But I, I don't think that's necessarily what they're saying. So we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. In other news, in Balasanore in Gujarat, India, a Rajasaurus narmadensis dinosaur egg has been found. It's in pieces, but it's going to be sent to the Geological Survey of India to be analyzed. In China, there's a global bidding process to create a dinosaur theme park in Yunyang County, which is at the site of a dinosaur fossil cluster, and they want to attract top planners and paleontologists and build a theme park that focuses on environmental protection and promotes scientific research of fossils. Dinosaur fossils were first found in the area in 2015, and the site was excavated in 2016. The area is about three miles or five kilometers long, and it has a fossil wall from the Jurassic. That is awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. There are good and bad things about how fast China builds, but the fact that they first discovered dinosaur fossils in the area like two and a half to three years ago, and they're building a theme park there now <laughs> yeah, is just amazing, and I'm jealous. <laughs> I was just hearing about like some of the construction in California that was pl- all planned out and ready to go like a decade ago, and it's just now starting. <laughs> mm. Meanwhile, in China, it would have been done eight years ago. (laughs) Yep, different infrastructure. It is very different, and obviously they do less environmental impact studies and things like that, but I'm still jealous. Yeah, it'll be cool to see what the theme park turns out to be like. Yeah. In Glen Rock, Wyoming, the Paleon Museum is a museum that is apparently completely run by volunteers, which is pretty awesome. And when the museum opened, Bob Bakker called the women who were volunteering bone biddies, which I, it sounded like they didn't like at first, but that name has since stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and volunteers are between 11 and 91 years old, and they run the gift shop, they clean fossils, they make scrapbooks, they give tours, they sew quilts for fundraising, and basically everything that you would need to do at that museum. <laughs> the museums, they call it small but mighty, and they have the only known lower jawbone of a torosaurus, and they have some T-Rex tracks and a lot of other fossils. Next, we've got an update from Utah. So Senator Kurt Bramble in Utah is looking to name Utah raptor as the state dinosaur instead of replacing Allosaurus as the state fossil. And you might remember that we talked about this. It all came about when a 10-year-old, Kenyon Roberts, proposed the replacement because it's got Utah in the name, and he thought Utah Raptor was really cool, but Allosaurus has a history in Utah, too, so it's good that they're able to figure out a way to have both. Yeah, for sure. And we kind of thought that would happen, because Jim Kirkland had said in one of the articles that maybe that would be the way to go. Yeah. It's nice that they're headed that direction. Yeah. It's nice to hear about such low-stakes legislation once in a while. (laughs) Everybody's happy with it, I hope. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully. In event news, Captain Flynn and the pirate dinosaurs are back, and I know we've talked about this show before. So on February 20th, there's going to be a one-hour show of Captain Flynn and the pirate dinosaurs 2, The Magic Cutlass at Story House in Chester in the UK. The show starts at 1.30 p.m., and it's going to feature (laughs) devious dinosaurs, deep-sea dangers, and smelly sausages. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) I wonder if they'll bring back the first one. This is, this is a sequel. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds fun. So this is just like a live action thing? Mm-hmm, with dinosaurs and pirates. Hmm. Or maybe they were dinosaurs as pirates. I can't remember the plot line now. 
Oh, that sounds vaguely familiar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> In game news, there's a new mobile survival game coming out called Dino War. The game is set in 2022, and in the game, a scientific lab brings dinosaurs back to life. The dinosaurs are quickly used for military use, and one scientist apparently unleashes dinosaurs that are infected with a deadly virus. So, world is coming to an end. And in the year 2041, there are survivors, and they find the abandoned science lab base, and they have to fight to end basically all of the danger. So, the game is developed by King's Group, and it's currently in a closed test beta. So, it sounds like maybe it'll be out in the next year or so. Interesting that it's set in 2022. And then four, 20 years later, yeah, that's when you actually play the game. Yeah, those are very oddly specific years, 2022 and then 2041, like 19 years later. <laughs> <laughs> it's also very soon. It's like four years from now. That's true. Usually you want to go a little bit farther out in the future or just set it in present day. Maybe they're playing off of Jurassic World. Like if Jurassic World were to happen this year... Maybe by 2022, these other things start to happen. Interesting. I have no idea, though. Yeah, because Jurassic World just went the this is right now approach. Mm -hmm. It also makes it easier for endorsements, like when they have the super obvious cell phones that they use, and they're like, let me check my Samsung Galaxy device. <laughs> oh, I never <laughs> noticed those. <laughs> or like the car pulls up, and it's got like the huge Mercedes logo, and it's a modern Mercedes and things like that. Yeah, I never noticed those. They're there. I'll point them out to you next time. Eh, I don't think that'll spoil things for me. <laughs> it probably will. <laughs> and last, in Portland, Maine, a bunch of people wearing T-Rex costumes gathered in Monument Square to dance to the song Walk the Dinosaur, it sounded like. It's fitting. And this event started back in 2015 when people showed up in costume to watch Jurassic World, and then this last dance fest was for, they said, like-minded dino pals. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And as a reminder, this episode is brought to you in part by TRX Dinosaurs, which we mentioned at the top of the show. They primarily make dinosaur puppets and posable sculptures and have begun branching out into animatronics if you're interested in something a little more exciting and interactive, potentially. Mm -hmm. And all of the things that they make are very scientifically accurate. Yeah, they do a lot of research and put a lot of effort into making the dinosaurs realistic. Primarily, they make theropods, which means lots of feathers all over the place. Yeah, they do great feathers. They do. And I know that they have made, by request, dinosaurs. Oh, I guess it was a juvenile T-Rex that didn't have feathers, and it was more Jurassic Park style so they can be a little bit flexible mm -hmm. with the interpretation if there's something specific that you have in mind. The T-Rex didn't have feathers, which is what I was thinking, like, oh, they left feathers off of that one. But there is that camp that thinks T-Rex didn't have feathers. So it's <laughs> like, maybe it is more realistic. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like they were ignoring feathers on Deinonychus or Velociraptor or something. Those always have feathers. But anyway... They have really awesome dinosaur sculptures and puppets, and if you're interested in getting one, you should go to trxdinosaurs.com and fill out their form, and you can describe what you want, and they'll work with you to custom make whatever kind of dinosaur you can imagine. Yeah, and if you're a museum looking for something to add to your exhibits, you could also work with them. Yep. We also have some exciting news from TRX Dinosaurs. So... If you've listened to previous episodes, you know that you can follow their works in progress on Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs. And the latest post... As of this recording. Yes, <laughs> as of this recording, good point, <laughs> is that they're hiring. Yeah, they're looking to find artists on the West Coast of the U.S., specifically those with experience making large sculptures, paintings, molds, casting, and everything in between. At least that's how it's described on Instagram. <laughs> and if you're interested in finding out more, then head over to Instagram and you can either email them or you can send them a direct message with some of your work. Yeah, so pretty exciting. If I was an artist, I'd want to get in on that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm like, I live there and I love dinosaurs, but I have almost zero artistic ability. <laughs> so unfortunately, I cannot apply. It's great to hear that they're expanding, though. It is. 
And if you do apply, please let us know. Love to see your work. For sure. And now on to the dinosaur of the day, Minmi, which was a request from Dinosaurs, 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 and Dinosaur4602, <laughs> both via YouTube. So I, thank you. I really like the Dinosaurs, Dinosaurs, Dinosaurs. The first name is Dinosaurs, Dinosaurs, and the last name is Dinosaurs. Yep. So it's Dinosaurs, Dinosaurs, Space, Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Minmi was an ankylosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Queensland, Australia, and was described in 1980 by Ralph Molnar. And Dr. Alan Barholome found the skeleton in 1964 near Minmi Crossing in Queensland. There's only one species. It's Minmi paravertebra. I wonder where that name Minmi came from. Could be the, the crossing. Maybe. <laughs> or it could be a coincidence. No, it's not. It <laughs> refers to the crossing, the Minmi Crossing. And... <laughs> That may also mean a large lily in the local Aboriginal language, but it may also come from Min Min, which is a will-o'-the-wisp. Interesting. Yep. And the species name refers to the bone elements found along the vertebrae. For 24 years, fun fact, Min Mi had the shortest dinosaur name until the dinosaur May was named in 2004, and now I think there's one even shorter, probably yeah, Ye. E. Yeah. yeah. Just Y-I. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There might even be one with just one letter. I don't know. Yeah, I was trying to imagine that, but I, I can't think of anything. I don't think you can make a word out of one letter other than A I. or I, which <laughs> isn't really a very good name for a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Minmi holotype consists of a partial skeleton with no skull, but there's back vertebrae, ribs, a right hind limb, and plates of the belly armor. And a more complete skeleton was found in 1989 that has the skull and articulated body armor, and it was referred to Minmi. But then in 2015, it was named its own genus. It became Kumbarasaurus. Other specimens found between 1989 and 1996 were referred to Minmi, and they had osteoderms and pelvis, ribs, partial thigh bone, and a partial shin bone. Nice. Yeah. So based on all that, Minmi is estimated to be about 3 meters or 9.8 feet long and weighed about 300 kilograms or 700 pounds. And it had long limbs, which it may have used to find cover under brushes to hide from large predators that may have been able to flip it on its back. Hmm. It was herbivorous, quadrupedal, and armored, but it did not have a club tail. It had scutes across its back and larger osteoderms on the neck, head, shoulders, and hips. And it had these horizontally oriented plates along the sides of its vertebrae, unlike other ankylosaurs. These horizontal osteoderms, which were thin bony rods, ran parallel to the vertebra instead of the ribs, which is how it got its species name, paravertebra. Makes sense. Yeah. In 1980, Molnar said that these plates were ossified tendons, but said that they looked like the pathological tendon aponeurosis, which is a sheet of tissue, of modern crocodiles. In 2014, Victoria Arbor said that this was unlikely and only found one distinctive trait in the holotype. But then in 2015... She and Phil Curry found that it wasn't unique, which would mean that the holotype had no diagnostic features and that Minmi was a gnomum dubian. But then the 2015 description of Kumbarasaurus said that there were new, unique Minmi traits and that it should be considered valid still. Molnar placed Minmi in Ankylosauria in 1980, though a new analysis in 2011 found that it was the basalmost known Ankylosaurid. Uh, Victoria Arbor and Phil Curry later found it to be too primitive to be in Ankylosauridae or Notosauridae. In 2010, Gregory Paul suggested it was part of Minmidae, <laughs> a very basal ankylosaur group that was isolated on Gondwana and included Antarctopelta. Then I guess it was just being an ankylosauroid at that point. Yeah. Minmi gut contents have been found. They're called colite. And a colite is a food pellet that was in its stomach and it shows what food it ate. So this pellet showed that Minmi ate seeds, fruit, stems, leaves, and plant tissue with spores, and the fibrous tissues were cut into small pieces, which helped show that it chopped up food with its teeth after cropping with its beak and did not use gastroliths. So if that's the case, Minmi probably had cheeks. Nice. Good old gut contents. <laughs> yeah. They're the best. <laughs> All Minmi specimens have been found in marine rocks, so when Minmi lived, its habitat was covered by a shallow sea and carcasses sometimes drifted out after floods. Uh, one specimen was found with teeth of small bramble sharks, so it's possible that the sharks ate some of the dead dinosaur as it laid upside down on the seafloor. Oh. Yeah. And our fun fact of the day is that the plural of Tyrannosaurus 
is Tyrannosaurus. And similarly, the plural of Tyrannosaurus rex or T-Rex is also Tyrannosaurus rex. So they're like sheep. <laughs> the plural and the singular are the same. But if you really want to make a plural version, you can say Tyrannosaurids, and that refers to different individuals within the Tyrannosaurus group. But if there is more than one species within the group, then that can be a little bit confusing. So you don't need to say Tyrannosauruses or Tyrannosaurus rexes or anything awkward like that. You can just say several Tyrannosaurus and then be done with it. So there you go. That might take me a while to get used to. I think you usually do it that way. Mm. A lot of people do it the other way. It is a little bit more clear if you add is on to the end of it, because then you know definitively that they're talking about a group. But just like sheep, people figure it out. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any new episodes. You can also join our growing community on Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.